Hello, hello. And welcome once again to a Beatles program, which we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we discuss what's going on news-wise in the world of the Beatles. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the co-hosts of the show, and uh, you might know me for another Beatles program that I host. It's called Every Little Thing, syndicated around the country. And I'm being joined by my co-host, the man who writes for Beatles Examiner. You can also call him Monkey Author. As he's been yeah. called many times. Person, yeah. <laughs> uh, Steve Marinucci. How you doing, Steve? Hi, Ken. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. And boy, what a week it has been. Yay. Uh, it's been an amazing gonna, week. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, I'm, I'm just a little drained at this point. I don't know yeah, about you. Yeah, you should be, because you went to the... Uh, the uh, events uh, in New York, I, I didn't get there, but uh, boy, that must have been something. They were all wonderful in their own way. I went to the Apollo show, mm -hmm. um, and I went to the one at Town Hall, where I was one of many MCs there. Mm -hmm. And I also was at the Fest on Sunday. So between, between Thursday and Sunday, I was in New York three of the four days. So it was pretty busy all those just give days. Me a, just give me a quick rundown on the, on the um, NYC Fab 50 things. How did how'd those work out? They were great. Uh, were they? If anything, they ran kind of long. Uh, the show at the Apollo was over three hours. Wow. And uh, they had so many acts, and each one either did one or two songs. And usually what the, the format was, and even this is for both shows, is that the performers would do some of their own material, and they would also do a Beatles song, or even a song that the Beatles covered. So in the case of the Apollo show, you would get an R&B artist come on, like, for example, Lloyd Price came on, and he did Stagger Lee, of course, one of mm -hmm. his big hits. At the same time, he also did Hey Jude. So, oh. you know, they, they counterbalance between their own songs and the Beatles songs. That's, that's, that's really good. That's a, that was a good idea. Well, it was that way at Town Hall as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, some really nice surprises in the Apollo show was the fact that um, you got to hear Barbara Harris sing and she was the lead singer in a band called The Toys. Right. And uh, they had a, a number two hit in the country called A Lover's Concerto, which yeah. you'll know as soon as you hear it. Mm -hmm. but you oh, just, I, yeah, I know that song very well. Yeah, so you hear the song, and she sounds exactly the same. And we're talking, what was that, 1965, 66, that was it? Fantastic. So you can just tell some of these people who you may not have ever seen live before sound terrific still, so they have to keep at it in order to do that. So there was also uh, one of the singers from the Cookies, and that was the all-girl group that sang Chains, which the mm -hmm. Beatles covered. She sounded fantastic. You had somebody like Lulu, who, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> just blew everybody off the stage. She was just so amazing. She sang to Sir With Love, and then she also sang Shout, and that Ugh. just brought the house down. She, and, she did that, that way back then. I mean, that's not, not a new number for her. Oh, no. That was, I think, it might have been her first U.K. hit. Yeah, I think I think you're right, actually. But, um, you know, she thinks of herself as an R&B singer, and also you got the British Invasion you can tie in as well. Right. So she was just fantastic. And as someone, you know, it's it's um, it was a thrill for me, first of all, to go to the Apollo. I've never seen any show there, and it's such a historic place. And, uh, of course, we should mention both John and Paul performed there. Right. Um, but, you know, every single legendary R&B act is performed at the Apollo. And just just to be in the presence of that place, it was a thrill for me. And then you've got somebody like um, Leslie Uggams, who, you know, I don't even know if when we had Charles Rosnay here, who, who was one of the uh, producers for the show, if, if he even brought up her name. But Leslie Uggams is someone that... I used to see all the time on television as a kid in the 60s and 70s. She'd be on variety shows and all. Didn't really she follow. Part, she was part of the Mitch Miller show. She oh, was singing along with Mitch. That's she was, right, that, yeah. That was her. Well, and she, she, was a late, she was a late addition, as I recall. Okay. Well, she was just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I mean, what a voice. She's had a, a long career in the theater, and she's now, I think she's 71 years old. And I tell you, man... <laughs> <laughs> she owned the place when she was singing. She wow. was just so good. You know, well, I'm, all... I'm glad to I'm glad to hear about that. Glad, you know, to, you glad get... to hear that. Those. How was Melanie? Melanie was at the town hall show. Oh, okay. That's fine. But um, you know, she was great. I mean, both those shows were wonderful in their own way. The 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 Apollo show had more of an R and B slant to it. Sure. 
But the town hall show had a lot of great performers. Tommy James came on with Gene Cornish together, Gene Cornish mm. from the Rascals. They did this medley of Crystal Blue Persuasion and Groovin', which okay. sounded nice acoustically. And, um, you know, Melanie came on. She did Brand New Key. She did Lay Down, and she also did Let It Be. And she's one of those people who's got one of those magic voices. You, right. know, you know it once you hear it. And she's just great. You know, I haven't seen her in... in probably about 10 years now as a performer. Was really I've, looking I had forward never to that. seen her, and, and she was a, such a pleasure to talk to on the phone. Yeah. She was, she was just absolutely fantastic. She's like, she's like a going back in a time machine. She's still got that, you know, 60s spirit in her. Yeah. And she, you know, and, and she, she was telling me, you know, things, and that's exactly the way she was. And it was, and it was very cool to, to, get to that again to get to that place and i hope she comes out i told her i hope she comes out to the west coast where i can see her yeah well next i would time, really like to catch her show if she's playing near me i'm definitely going to see her you know mm -hmm. she, she's a hero for me she's just one of the great singers and someone that doesn't get nearly enough credit and to me just the fact that she played at woodstock but anyway but, uh you know i saw so many great performers there and uh people that i've never seen live before randy jackson is someone that i don't know if you heard of he was in the band zebra and Zebra is this band that I grew up hearing because I, I spent most of my teenage years and in my 20s and 30s on Long Island. And they were known kind of as being a Long Island band, though they really came from New Orleans. Mm -hmm. But when they first came out, Jack Douglas produced them. And uh, they sounded, or at least Randy sounded, like Robert Plant. A lot of people thought this band was like a Led Zeppelin clone. But the first album sold really well. So they have a, they have a big following. At least I, I know from Long Island they had, they had a big following there. And they also did this John Lennon tribute, which I play on my show once in a while, mm -hmm. which is called Lullaby, really pretty song. And I, and I approached Randy and I told him that I play the song and he was very flattered to hear that. And he's got a new album coming out. Melanie has a new album coming out. I met Walter Egan, who's like the nicest guy. who's known for Magnet and Steel, big hit in the 70s, 1978. Right. So many really great performers that were there on stage. Aztec Two-Step was there. Uh, Al Jardine performed. Oh, uh, God. Uh, that's, if I was going to go see anyone, it would have been to see Al Jardine because I'm a Beach Boy crazy. I love the Beach Boys. Uh huh. Well, he sounded great. You know, he did Help and Rhonda. Did. You know, everybody. The, the, the beautiful thing about these particular shows is that, and it's nice to have this contrast between this and the Fest for Beatle fans because most of the people who are there at the Fest for Beatle fans, especially this year, it's a lot of British invasion artists who are connected with the Beatles. Mm-hmm. But the, but what I'm what I'm trying to say is that you, it's nice to have the contrast between these shows and the ones at the fest because even though the artists that were on at the Apollo and uh, at Town Hall for the most part are people that are not connected to the Beatles, it's nice to see this cross section of so many different artists of different genres, and the Beatles music connects with them in some way it, you know the Beatles music connects with people of different decades of different genres sure. and that's part of the magic of the music is the fact right. that it appeals to different age groups and different styles of music and there's so many different interpretations of and, their music and nowhere did we see this you know uh, la last week over the last week and especially at the CBS special which we're here to talk about right <laughs> <laughs> You'd but never, anyway, um, you'd, you'd never no. know that from the beginning of our show, though. Well, what were we going to talk about today was the it was the CBS special, uh, the night they changed America, a Grammy salute to the Beatles. It got a lot of hype. It got it. Uh, it was, you know, everybody was kind of waiting for it, obviously because they everybody knew that Paul and Ringo were there, but nobody really kind of knew what to expect. And I have to say that going in, I was kind of going. You know how much how much corniness are we going to have to endure with all the the new groups doing the doing the Beatles music? And I have to say, at the at the end, you know, I was I was surprised. The special was I wouldn't call it the greatest thing that, that ever happened, but I was very I was kind of I was pretty pleased. Mm -hmm. I think the the Letterman interview. I wish the Letterman interview had been a lot longer. I wish they had used a lot more than they did. I wish they had showed them watching the uh, the Sullivan show because it looked like they just kind of dragged them into the theater there and they were talking about you know being on the show, which was great. But um, I did enjoy those segments. 
I loved the historical interviews with everybody from the Sullivan Show. I thought that was fantastic. I thought a lot of the music was was pretty good. Um, I thought, you know, of course, the Paul and Ringo parts were were really really good. I thought <laughs> Ringo was outstanding. I, I will have agree. Never seen Ringo as good as he was on that show. He well, was he just, he was so animated. He was pumped. He was pumped, and he was also he was he just sounded really good. I mean, the band, and not to take away from the All Star Band because they're a good group of musicians, but they, everybody just sounded really good, and mm-hmm. it was just really fantastic. So there were parts of it. I mean, I I have to say that a lot of the current stuff didn't really do much for me. You know, Maroon Five sounded you know okay. I mean, you know, some of that stuff I, I just really didn't take too much too much of that. I loved Jeff Lynne doing something. I, that just tugged at my heartstrings. I mm-hmm. mean, that was just fantastic. Well, uh, and not only that, but I mean, Danny Harrison singing it with him and harmonizing so oh, well. Oh yeah, I mean that was a yeah. uh, that was an absolute highlight. Stevie Wonder doing "We Can Work It Out," which, for those who don't know, he did back in the '60s. And no, 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 was, no. It was a hit for him in 1971. Was it 71? Okay, yeah. Well, close. <laughs> but I mean, it was a great version back then, and he basically just did the same thing he did then and mm-hmm. now. I kind of wish there had been more old uh, artists uh, there. Uh, I mean, I don't count Dave Grohl as old, um, <laughs> but uh, I'm glad. I was glad to see the Eurythmics there, of course. Um, yeah, because not just because they were there, but because they were a great group. Uh, they were they were outstanding, and it was great to see them back uh together again doing you know e- even just for the one song so i mean a lot of it you know uh, i overall if i had to give it a grade i would probably give it a b minus i think it was i think it was good i don't think it was uh, you know i don't think it was you know emmy winning it might it might win an emmy but um i didn't think it was outstanding outstanding but it was much. It was better than I expected it was going to be. I have to say. Boy, you're um, critical. <laughs> huh? I think you're critical, but you, you think know, I'm critical. Uh, yeah. I, a lot of these, these reunion type specials and things, get dragged down by stuff that's really unnecessary. And of course, with this one, there was some unnecessary stuff, but a lot of it was a lot of it was good. And I mean, that's a tribute to the music that it was so good. And of course, Paul and Ringo were what everybody really wanted to see. I what? wish it was much longer. They are, they originally had planned it for two hours, and they lengthened it to two and a half. I'm hoping that they decide to release it on video. We'll see what happens there. Mm-hmm. A lot of people are call, were calling for that immediately the day after, and I think that's a natural choice. And uh, it wouldn't be surprising if it did happen, but uh, because it was so good. But at this point, there's nothing saying that it's going to happen. So mm-hmm. we'll see. What would you say was unnecessary in the special? I'm just I'm one of these people that I'm not a real modern music person. So uh-huh. you know, people like Katy Perry and, and stuff, and Katy Perry, Perry, for example, don't do a lot for me. Mm-hmm. I realize why she. I know why she was there. She was there for the younger audience, and that's fine. But personally speaking. She doesn't do a lot for me. But, you so, know, it, this is a pattern that's been going on for a long time with a lot of specials, and especially at the Grammy Awards, where they pair up veteran artists with new artists. Right. So you can, you know, have the different generation gaps come together. Sure. You know, and, uh, and some people like that idea, some people don't. And, right. And I've know, never been, uh, I, as a person who is not a big fan of modern music, I'm just kind of... I'll put up with. I mean, in, in a case like this, I will put up with it. <laughs> you can put up it with it because okay. of all the other stuff that was there. Uh huh. But I'm not. Uh, I'm not a fan of it. Okay. All right. Well, I think the the show was extremely good. Much better than I thought it was going to be. See, there and, on that we agree because I really went in not sure. You know, not sure how good it was going to be, and I there was a lot of things, uh, especially with the modern artists that, you know, had me going, you know, I bet this isn't going to be that great. Because, I mean, in a lot of these specials, 
they get dragged down, you know, and a lot of silliness. But go ahead. I'm sorry. No. So just before I even go into what I want to say, mm-hmm. I know I brought this up before, and I think I brought it up when Charles Rosenay was with us, but you probably, because I like making this analogy between the concerts that Yoko has done that are tribute uh, concerts for John and the concert for George. And they were two completely different approaches because when Yoko does those concerts, they usually are a mixture of very new artists with a few veterans. Whereas the concert for George were all veterans and people that were friends of George's that mattered to George. Mm -hmm. You probably would prefer something like a concert for George approach in something like this, as opposed to mixing the old and the new artists. You know, actually, the Yoko idea works for me because it doesn't try to be a Beatle concert, or it doesn't try to... She takes things so far out on a limb that she's always kind of elbowing the boundaries. Mm -hmm. And I always... That's one thing I love about her, is that that's exactly what she does. And, you know, you kind of knew that most of the artists would stay pretty close to the original arrangements. They wouldn't go, they wouldn't get crazy. And they, they kind of, they really didn't, I mean, for the most part. Right. Um, I mean, because you were talking, you had a, you know, you had a, a mainstream audience that, that was going to watch the show and they knew that. Whereas Yoko doesn't care about that. And, I, and God bless her for that. Mm-hmm. You know, she, she takes you to a, a, a different place. She's not afraid to go outside your expectations. And why do you, why do you say the Beatles are a mainstream audience? Don't the Beatles appeal to all different types of audiences? What I'm saying is a general audience. I think you're I think you're misinterpreting that. In putting together a special like this, the network wanted to keep it to a, a general audience, which is why probably Yoko wasn't there performing. Can you imagine if Yoko had been part of this special? Uh huh. I don't think that that probably wouldn't have happened. I really, well, I mean, I should say, I mean, it didn't happen, but I mean, I probably don't think they even considered putting her in there. Okay. Because she's, her music is so different and so out there. And so they basically kept safe choices. In other words, I guess is probably what I'm trying to say. All right. They, they kept safe, safe artistic choices, and that's fine. But, you know, I, I think it would have been, you know, with some of the and with, thing, with people like Katy Perry, for example, and uh, Alicia Keys, you didn't expect anything unusual, and there wasn't really. Mm-hmm. Um, probably, maybe the closest was the idea of getting the lo- the love group in there. You know, that was probably the closest thing, and I didn't even think that was all that that was all that unusual because anybody who's seen the love show knows that really goes kind of out there as far as the interpretations and, and everything. And that really, they really didn't do that with what was there. So. Okay. Well, overall, I think that the, uh, the show was, was really good. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, there's so much that I loved about it, uh, especially the performances. I love all the different covers. Uh, just like you, one of the absolute biggest highlights was Jeff Lynn and, and Danny Harrison singing, mm-hmm singing something along with Joe Walsh and the band. And also, um, <laughs> I love watching the reactions from the audience. I mean, when do you ever get a chance to see Paul and Ringo observe other people doing their music? Right. And so on a song like Something, there's one moment there where Ringo is doing like a drum roll, where mm-hmm. it would have been in the song. So you kind of feel like he wants to be up there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and Paul had some emotional reactions during the special, during various points in the special uh-huh. that you could you could kind of see that he was very he was quite touched by some of the stuff that was going on there, mm-hmm. and that was that was pretty cool too. And then and then there was Yoko's dancing, which was which was so <laughs> what, that was really wonderful. I have to give you know I have to say that that um, I mean she didn't perform, but she got she got in there, and and you know that was that was pretty nice. I must say, you know, I was surprised. There was a lot of um, camera time devoted to Yoko and Sean. And mm-hmm. it's really nice to see, like, um, when Don't Let Me Down was performed. And that was um, John Mayer and Keith Urban. You know, Sean's singing along with it. You know, it's cool to see him mouthing 
the the title of the song don't let me down it's just really nice to see that reaction as it's happening yeah you know one one thing one thing that various people have mentioned and i guess it's worth mentioning it's it's probably something we should talk about is number one why sean wasn't up on the stage and mm. i i'm kind of curious about that i would think that he would have been he would have been good to be up there but the other thing is where was julian and well you know we can speculate but we don't really know <laughs> no we don't and there's been comment he's he's made a he made a statement on on his page but i'm not sure that you know that really we don't know uh and it's it you know he, I, I saw there I mean, was a quote from him where he said he doesn't really go for that kind of big tribute kind of thing. Right, and any any you know that any performance he would have made, or any performance actually that Sean would have made, would have been compared to John. And it's not um, just that, but the more the more of the Beatles kids that are there, the more pressure there's going to be to put them all up there with Paul and Ringo. Mm-hmm. And at the very end of the show, when, when they're doing Hey Jude, it was nice to see Danny up there, you know, amongst the crowd of people singing the Nanas. But, you know, if you had had Julian there, too, with Sean, and nobody's even mentioning James. Nobody's saying, where's James McCartney <laughs> in this show? And no one's saying, where are Ringo's kids? Nobody right. ever brings them up. But, uh, no, it's, 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 um, it's got to be weird to be in that situation. Uh, Sean, in his own way paid tribute because he was on Late Night with David Letterman and he performed with the Flaming Lips and he did Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. So maybe in his own way, that was his own tribute. Right. But, you know, it's such a heavy thing, you know, to be the son of to, or to be the daughter, the daughter of <laughs> any of mm-hmm. the Beals. Everything you do is compared to what, what your father has done. And sure. uh, just like the solo Beatles work is compared to what they did as a Beatle. That's, you know, it goes on and on and on. And it's a very tough thing to have to deal with. And um, at times, I'm sure it's gotten to the Beatles kids and it's not always easy to, to stay level head, level headed throughout right. all this stuff and how to handle it all. And, um, you know, I'm sure Julian has been through hell in his own mind. as has Sean, you know, there's a lot of people who just will not, ever look at them and try to accept them for themselves at their own level instead of just you know compared to what his father did you know and uh it's still that way with a lot of people but anyway still th- this was an amazing show i i love stevie wonder we can work it out that's always been one of my favorites and stevie's yeah, same here. outside of the beatles he's probably my favorite artist ever mm. <laughs> so okay. for him to be up there you know it's stevie <laughs> that's all i have to say um I loved uh, Imagine Dragons. I thought that really? their version of Revolution was really cool, all acoustic, and it made me think of uh, the Beatles demo of that, the White Album demo. Okay. Which was more, it was acoustic and up-tempo, just kind of mm-hmm. like what they did. And their harmonies are really nice, so I like that particular treatment given to Revolution. I like Don't Let Me Down from John Mayer and Keith Urban. And again, a uh, big highlight is watching Sean sing along with it. And they're really good guitar players. I like their guitar work on there. And you had mentioned before, and I want to make sure that I give just as much credit for this backup band, because I'm really digging this band. This this band started with the David Lynch, uh, tr- right. the, the award that was given to Ringo, the Peace and Love Award. Right. And Don was, was the music director, and um, he got Peter Frampton and Steve Lukather to play guitar and Kenny Aronoff on drums. What a marvelous band that is. I, I could, really wish that I, I had really thought that possibly peter frampton would be coming back to the all-stars and apparently that's not the case yeah and it's a shame because he was i the show i remember when he was with them he was fantastic he yes was, it's one of the fact, best the night that the night he was with them i don't think he did this on every stop on the tour but he performed by himself he did an acoustic version of norwegian wood mm-hmm. that had us all going wow <laughs> That was just, that was something. That was, right. well, no pun intended, but it was fantastic. Uh-huh. <laughs> it, was, it was fantastic, and I was really hoping he would be back with Ringo because um, another, and he, he um, has a history in, in, this, in the San Francisco area. When he first performed at, uh, when he was uh, um, opening for John Mayall, there was a sign, because they recorded Frampton Comes Alive here, and there was a sign in the audience 
that said, we're here to see you, Peter. And he apparently got really, he really enjoyed that. That gave him a lot of inspiration. Hmm. And um, he's apparently had always a connect, always had a connection with the Bay Area. And so I was really hoping that he would be back here again, that he would do that again, or he would play with Ringo again. Um, well, you never know. I mean, you, you never know. I mean, the 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 lineup of the All Star Band is always changeable, and it could always happen in the future. Mm-hmm. But, but I'm, I'm just I was saying. glad to see Ringo. I mean, glad to see uh, Peter Frampton back in some role, in some capacity. That, with that Ringo, was yeah, cool. that was very cool. Uh huh. Well, I, like I said, I'm getting really used to Peter Frampton with Steve Lukather. there. I mean, that mm-hmm. that is an All Star Band to itself with Ken it Aronoff. Is. <laughs> it is. Uh, it really is. The Rhythmics, like you said, that was a real highlight to see them get back together. And they did it for this show, which they shows do. how important the Beatles are to them. Right. And I think Annie Lennox sang her heart out on Fool on the Hill. You know, and Annie's never gotten... I mean, she's always been considered a great artist or a good artist, but I think she's really in a class by herself. She's outstanding. As a singer, you mean? Yes. Mm-hmm. I, think, I really think she is. I agree with you. A very unique voice, too, and powerful. Yes. But um, just imagine what it must be like for someone like her. And I know Dave Stewart has had a relationship with uh, three of the four Beatles. Mm -hmm. So um, he's been friends with them. But for Annie Lennox to sing Fool on the Hill in front of Paul Mm -hmm. and Ringo, what a a thrill that must be. Right. And uh, they got a standing ovation. Paul and Ringo stood up after they did Fool on the Hill. So that must have been a great feeling. Um, Dave Grohl, outstanding with Hey Bulldog. Okay. And uh, nice to see Paul sing along with it in the audience there. Mm-hmm. And uh, Jeff Lynne was on that, and Steve Lukather did lead guitar work. Really nice. And I, I also love the speech that Dave Grohl made before he performed. Really short, but to the point, about the Beatles were, they knew no boundaries. They were in a class all by themselves. Mm-hmm. And pointing out his daughter in the audience, that she's a new Beatle fan. Added a Actually, nice touch uh, to it. And, and you're reminding me, when Ringo was performing... He pointed to her. Did you see that? That was so cute. Uh-huh. That was that was so cute. Well, Ringo loves connecting with little kids. Right. Right. But uh, yeah, so that was that was a nice that was a nice part of the show. Mhm. And I loved While My Guitar Gently Weeps with Gary Clark Jr. and uh Joe Walsh and Dave Grohl on drums and Joe Walsh sang so well. His mm-hmm. voice is so so really good there. Joe, um, you know, Joe's Really, I mean, he's really, the last couple of years, he's been outstanding. He really has. His solo album, again, something that didn't get as much play as it should have been, as it should have, but that solo album was really, really good. Right. I agree. And, um, yeah, I mean, he's, and he, get, and he gets to be uh, Rinko's brother-in-law. That's, <laughs> how cool is that? I know. <laughs> he can be in the All-Stars anytime he wants. Oh, sure he could. Yeah. Sure he could. Uh, I mean, that would be that would be a t- real treat if he decided to come back. Mm-hmm. Um, that would be just amazing. I'm not sure that it'll, it, it would happen, but it would be amazing. Right. It, I loved um, the version of Here Comes the Sun with uh, Farrell Williams and Brad Paisley. Mm-hmm. And, the, um, hat, the hat was distracting, but oh well. <laughs> Peter Frampton and Steve Lukather, again, playing on acoustic guitars, and the sound they got from those acoustics were just wonderful. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I, I want to know why Tom Hanks is always getting good seats at these events. <laughs> I, it's like, what is Tom Hanks doing there? Please. You hey, know, Tom. I mean, I, I, you know, I kept thinking about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and him inducting the Dave Clark Five. Like, what, what, you know? What's going on here? That's because everybody loves Tom Hanks. I guess so. <laughs> I guess maybe they're um, maybe they're thanking him in a way for that thing you do, which you know was a great movie. I well, have to say. But. Don't forget, he was at the concert for George too, and he performed with Monty Python. Oh yes. <laughs> and he also was behind this um, this ten part series on the sixties, which yeah, has I aired know. on oh, CNN, the um, the British Invasion they showed, which I'm sure they're going to re air. But um, you know, and he was, all, and he also, I don't know if this pro- the project is still underway or not, but he was mentioned as one of the co-producers of, the, of a, a Brian Upstein bio. Mm-hmm. Not, and we're not talking about the the Fifth Beatle thing. We're talking about we're talking about a separate project. So there's another Beatle connection for Tom Hanks. Well, he's obviously a major fan. 
obviously. You know, and you, uh, anything that Tom Hanks does, for the most part, turns out to be high quality. Mm -hmm. So I'm more than happy. And that, Tom, to see Hanks Tom Hanks is a Bay Area guy, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. So from he's from Oakland, up the road a ways, but this is his stomping ground. So. Oh, well. But um, the performances from Ringo and Paul, we've got to talk about, I think, you know, like we just said, Ringo was outstanding. And, um, you know, it's just nice to see him so enthusiastic and so into this whole thing. And it, it's still a marvel. And I say this every time he tours with the All-Stars, how much energy the guy has. And, and um, you know, running on stage in the middle of Yellow Submarine. The man's 73 years old. My wife, and, my wife was watching the, the end when he did the jumping jacks, and she was just yep. going... Wow. Wow. <laughs> well, he does that at every All-Star Band tour. Oh, I know when, he does, but yeah. it, it, was, it was great to see him actually do that on television. And, and, I mean, that's one of the things that you, you know, when you see him with the All-Star Band, when you see that, you kind of you go, good grief, you know, how old is this guy? Uh-huh. You know, and it's just, it's just amazing. Right. I, I just, I, I don't know. <laughs> he, he's as healthy as could be, and God bless him. Yep. And uh, it was also nice to see, because anytime you see Ringo in the All-Stars, anytime he does Yellow Submarine, which is usually in the middle of his show, everybody waves the peace sign in the audience. Right. And you could see Paul waving the peace sign along with everybody else. Yep. How cool was that? <laughs> you know, that, that whole peace and love thing, you know, everybody kind of chuckles at it, but you really have to give him, you know, everybody will first think of Yoko because of her... Of her you know, her marriage to John as being uh, the big peace person. Uh -huh. But you really have to credit, give Ringo some credit for being, and he, uh, being so, so gung-ho on peace. The funny thing is, he's not political about it. Mm -hmm. he, he, unlike Yoko, Yoko is very politically minded, and that's where that, that all comes from. But he just does it, and it's, it's, so, it's so nice. And, you know, I would love to hear him actually talk about that a little bit sometime, mm -hmm. about why that is. Well, actually, he did it in the Variety interview. They that wonderful Variety interview recently. He kind of talked about it. And, you know, you have to give him a lot of credit. You know, the the John's passing, you know, really shook him up, you know, had a major effect on him as, as you know, he as you saw in, in the... Uh, and it's so cool that he that he does that, um, and he doesn't really get enough credit for doing. That. Everybody kind of makes fun of the peace signs, but it's it's really him being very positive, and I think that's that's so great. Right. Hmm. And uh, of course, there's Paul's performance, which I thought was magnificent. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are all songs that he's done live before, so it's not a shocker in any way. But he kept it all rockers, and his voice, I think, sounded great. You know, he did Birthday, Get Back, and you could see Yoko and Sean into that song <laughs> in mm -hmm. the audience. And he did, he did Magical Mystery Tour in, you know, at, at the taping, and hopefully maybe we'll get to see that at some point. But uh, Is that the only song that's missing from Paul? He did, at the show he did, I saw or on TV he did, uh, I saw her standing there, Get Back, Birthday, Sergeant Pepper, with a little help, and Hey Jude. With you know, with the songs they did with Ringo, but at the show, did, he also did Magical Mystery Tour. It looks like, yeah, I believe that was, I believe that was the only one. Okay. So hopefully, if we do get to see, if this thing d does get released on video, we will get to see. Uh, well, obviously, we will. We'll get to see Magical Mystery Tour. Okay. So. But um, it's just so nice for him to do Sgt. Pepper and then to go into with a little help from my friends. With Ringo running out on stage a, and singing Yeah, that it. was a great way to introduce Ringo rather than have, have somebody say, And now here's Ringo, you know. Right. I mean, that was just really... I got to say, though, the one really bad part of the show was Sean um, Penn. Oh, my God. Why did anybody use him? Why did they use him? What's he wrong? Was terrible. What's wrong he was with horrible. him? He was horrible. Huh. He, he was terrible. That introduction... Of, I mean, he introduced Paul and he was horrible. I didn't think he was that bad. <laughs> I he sound he he really I'm surprised he he sounded like he was gonna fall asleep or something. I mean I thought he was terrible. Yeah. Oh, all right. Well anyway, um and then to end with Hey Jude, 
which was a natural. Which was, and, yeah, you knew that was coming. And so nice just to see Ringo behind Paul on drums. I wish there was more of it. I think we all feel that way. But it was, uh, you know, a magical evening. The, the few things that I would complain about, mm-hmm. and there always are, <laughs> I'm not a big fan of when you see the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, they do a song, and then they seg right into the performers do it. Oh, the way they did it with, um, with Maroon, uh, 5, Maroon 5? With All My Lovin'? yeah. And uh, I really don't like when they do that. Also, with Don't Let Me Down, they did that with um, John Mayer and Keith Urban. Just play the song. You know, I I don't really care for when they do that. Also, for people who, you know, I remember talking to you about this when we first found out about the actual Grammy Awards. Mm -hmm. And we were told, Ringo said that that he and Paul weren't going to perform anything together. And then we we heard, well, it's all going to happen at this special. And I said, you know, that's really the right thing to do because this is going to air on February 9th. So, you know, tie it all in with the Ed Sullivan show. But the one drawback about that is think back to 1964 when this all happened on the Ed Sullivan show. Everybody was watching the Beatles for the first time or most of us for the first time. We didn't know what songs they were going to do. And I don't really like, you know, in this day and age, it's almost impossible not to find out what the songs are. But even if you went out of your way, not to go on the internet, not to look at Beatles Examiner, (laughs) you know, not to find out, if you watch the broadcast, they had promos that would announce, well, coming up, we've got Paul and Ringo. Hey, Jude. You know, it's like there's no surprise. I don't think think that's something that would have, I mean, there's no way you can get away from that. It's just, that's just a natural thing with, the way they edit these shows and the way they put them together, I don't think that would... There's not a music show or any other kind of show, for example, for that matter, that doesn't do that kind of thing. It doesn't even pay to go out of your way to try to not know anymore, because you're going to find out. You know, Yeah, but nice. teaser, teasers are part of the business. It's part of the, It's used in the news business, for example, um, on your nightly news reports to try uh-huh. and get you to... Um, well... I mean, it, I realize that's a different situation, but, you know, they tease you on news, on news stories to try and get you to stay tuned in and listen and watch. And that's really, that's really what all that is. And, and especially when you're dealing with stars of this magnitude, you want to give people a, a reason to, to stick around. And, and obviously, you know, especially at the beginning of the show, there are people who are tuning in that aren't that tuned into the Beatles mm-hmm. and you know don't know a whole lot about the whole thing and and that's really what that i mean i i yeah you can you can say they didn't do that, but I don't think there's the reality of the situation yeah well, that's what happens if it's pre taped in some ways the Grammys the Grammy awards itself was special in its own way because we didn't know about Queenie Eye. Right. You know, that was a nice surprise right there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we knew Ringo was going to do something. We didn't know if it was photograph. It could have been been any of his songs. But just not knowing and then finding out as it's happening is special to itself. Right. But um, also, I kind of wish that between Paul and Ringo, they had done something that the Beatles did on Ed Sullivan in that first show. That's a you know, that's a that's a very good that's a really good point. Um, oh, actually, yeah. actually, well, what am I saying? Paul did. I saw her standing there. Okay, but it would have been really nice if, if Paul had done all my loving, considering that's the first song. Mm-hmm. And uh, I want to hold your hand. I mean, that was the song that broke them big here in America. And uh, it would have been real super cool if Paul had done that because you know he he's done songs that John sang lead to, and even though he harmonized with John on the song. You know, you tend to think of John's voice more so than Paul on that song. But, um, you know, it would have been cool if they had done that. Uh, that's a great point. I, I really, it really would have been nice to see them do a saw her standing there together. It's too bad that mm. it didn't happen. Yeah, I wasn't even thinking about together, but even that's a valid point right there. Mm-hmm. But something to represent the Ed Sullivan, you know, shows, whether it's the first or the other ones. Mm-hmm. That would have been nice. In a way, I was kind of disappointed that Maroon 5 did All My Loving because I was thinking maybe Paul might do it. Yeah. I mean, and it is yeah. a song that he's done quite a lot, you know, in his tours. The band certainly knows that he could have easily broke into that. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. But um, yeah. just the few criticisms that I have to make. I did like the interview with David Letterman. 
I there was just a you know a few very interesting things that were said in the interview that I thought were really interesting and probably the best question that they were asked excellent question is how did you pick the set list for the first show yeah that was I a mean, good that was a very good question I love that question and Ringo was the one who answered it and he said well we knew we had to do the hit meaning I want to hold your hand but he also said the great thing about the set list is that it showed their diversity and they could have done anything. But, you know, you kind of wonder, did they put any thought behind those five songs? Why did it have to be those five? And also, and I'm saying this because somebody actually posted this on Facebook today and it got me thinking, you do know that George was sick the day before. Right. Yeah, I had the comment about, about George not singing anything. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that. I saw that too. And yeah, that was kind of, that is, very telling and he was he was really sick and uh but uh, in fact i mean they had uh, they had two people stand in for him neil aspinall and vince calandra uh-huh. and, um so yeah that was probably that was probably uh, on purpose there but that would have been really interesting i mean we've we've got these performances burned into our brains now but considering the fact that at that time the beatles were doing roll over beethoven in concert first mm-hmm. song they did at the Washington Coliseum, their first concert in America, they could have done Roll Over Beethoven in that first show. And, right. And ha- I, do cha- I do kind of challenge Ringo's contention they had to do the hit because really on that night, nobody really knew them that well. They weren't as well known as they, you know, as they would have been a couple of weeks later. Oh, a but lot still... Of American, a lot of Americans myself included, were experiencing them live for the very first time. But, but Steve, I Want to Hold Your Hand was the song. That was the one that, that won us over. That was the first big hit. That's the one that was number one while they were doing this. Well, how that's could true. They, I mean, that's, that's true. How could they not do that song? No, I'm but, not saying not. But um, I think what he said about, uh, you know, that they kind of knew what they were had to do i'm not sure i'm not sure that they, they i'm not sure that's true um but i mean it's not that they didn't pick good songs i mean they did all my loving was a great song oh, what, she, what loves she loves you she loves you yeah had, she loves you was was next to i want to hold your hand was the was the iconic song that was i mean that was the image actually that you took away from that thing was them shaking their heads together that was what I remember seeing on TV for weeks afterward, you know. Uh huh. No, but um, you know, now I look at those those three performances in a row, and I think they picked the right material. So uh, it, it's it's a a very good question. I, I just I love the fact that David Letterman came up with a question that good. <laughs> and it's it was not it was nice that they went into that they actually went into the theater again it was nice to, and I, I loved when when letterman pointed out that they had actually torn down i shouldn't say i loved it I, it was very interesting when he when he mentioned that the place doesn't have as many seats as it did when when sullivan was there hmm. that they had torn out one of the balconies and i also and i wish and apparently it ha- must have happened well it ha- obviously happened after they had put the special together that they could have had the shot of the the remade uh, marquee with the the salt with the Sullivan the tribute they did. Yeah, wasn't that nice? That was that was very cool. I was very that was very nice to read. To, when I was in New York over the the past weekend for all the different events, I made sure that uh, I posed there with my oh, wife, did you? with okay. my wife and with my son. So mm. that'll be on Facebook. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah. I, I I was I'm I'm glad you mentioned that. That you had gone there, yeah. And I yeah, also, I, I also like the story because I don't remember Paul ever saying this, but when they're talking about the name, the Beatles, mm-hmm. and who came up with the name, and Paul said John, you know, I always heard that that Stu Sutcliffe, you know, mentioned it. That was his idea. He brought it to John. John approved it. You still hear a lot of different stories about the name, but they really got it from the Crickets being Buddy Holly's band, but. Paul had mentioned that he loved the fact that with the name the crickets, it had a double meaning to him. It meant the insect, and it also meant the game, the sport in England, playing right. cricket. And he brought it up to the band, the crickets, and they didn't even know anything about the game cricket. <laughs> and the audience was laughing along with that. So that mm-hmm. was a yeah, cute... I, yeah, that's true. I, I, that was kind of an interesting point uh, that he made. 
And the only other thing that I, I find interesting, because it, it tells you a lot about their character as people, but in, in the case of Paul, the fact that he said that, well, for one thing, he, wa- he didn't really know if he was going to do and perform at this show, because yes, it's a tribute to the Beatles, but why would he be there as a tribute to himself? It's kind of awkward. But he also said at the same time that, you know, he didn't realize how much the show meant to so many people. And you got to, you know, turn your head when you hear that, you know, how can he not know, you know, in terms of history, how important this show has become. But it also makes you aware that, you know, Paul doesn't analyze his life. He's like one of those people that I really think just goes about his business, does his work, does his music, pretty much working on that, living that life, and not being consumed with who he is and and where he is historically. Mm -hmm. So I think that kind of shocks a lot of people when when Paul says something like that. Right. It gives you you a little insight into his thinking. Yeah. Um, And maybe, maybe... That's also a good thing, because if you think too much of yourself and where you are and your place in this world and who you are historically and you, you're so consumed in that, if you if you are, that that uh, is not very healthy. Well, on the other hand, too, I, uh, you know, he's getting to the point, I mean, he's getting up there in years to where he's going to have to start thinking about, the, you know, thinking more about that. At least I think he is. I don't think that's in his character. <laughs> no, I, 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 I agree with you there. And it's been a, I mean, he turned down that, um, the Kennedy Center honors that one year, and he finally, he finally did that. Hmm. But he, he did turn it down, which shocked the heck out of everybody. And, you know, it's not something people generally do, and he did it. And, yeah, he doesn't like to, he, he prefers to, that's why, you know, I think that's a good reason why he's still out on the road, because he wants to be current. He wants to be now. He doesn't want a lot of, although obviously he has to do Beatles stuff, but he also wants to be, you know, appreciated for what he does now. Mm-hmm. That's probably why the album's called New. Okay. Well, there you go. But uh, overall, I think this was a really good special. Yeah. And I, I would definitely uh, hope that this is coming out on DVD. I would also with a lot of material that we haven't seen. And not even not just the performances. There could be other stuff. Right. More it interview went, material. The taping the taping of the special ran four and a half hours and the Letterman interview I think we only got to see a little bit of it. So yeah, I would hope if it does happen we'll get to see a lot more. Okay. So if any of you would like to write to us, there's a very easy way you can do so. Our email address is things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. If you want to write to me personally, you can do so at every little thing at att dot net. You can also friend me on Facebook under my name Ken Michaels. You could friend us for our show, Things We Said Today. You can completely bury yourself in my website, which is KenMichaelsRadio dot com, because there's so much there to uh, get into interviews and trivia and contests and you name it you never know from week to week what's going to be on the website but i uh, highly recommend it kenmichaelsradio.com and for you steve you people... can email me at beatlesexaminer at gmail.com you can friend my facebook page under my name you can go to the the radio show page like ken just mentioned um and i have pages for beatles examiner and all my other examiner columns, and I even have a page for the monkey's book. How about that? Hmm. But anyway, um, so there's a, there's a lot of places you can get in touch with us. But in my case, Beatles, write to me at beatlesexaminer at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter. I'm making a spectacle myself there. Uh, <laughs> friend me there. Uh, if, and uh, hey, I'm, I'm there. All right. So this was fun, talking about this show. It was. And... Uh, Well, we want to take this time to thank each and every one of you for listening to Things We Said Today. I'm Ken Michaels, and I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci thanking uh, Fab Four Radio for running us on the weekend, and we'll see you next time.